Okay, guys, welcome back to the channel. It's been a little while since I released one. Usually I release two or more a week, but been pretty busy due to the hurricane that hit Louisiana. That's where a few of my businesses are located, and I actually have some friends there. Uh, you recall my friend Doug is based there with his system that I have a video series on. Some of my other friends there, they lost their whole system, record collection, everything. So it's been a terrible uh, cost to you know, livelihoods down in that area and businesses. So been really busy with that right now. But do have, wanted to get you caught up real quickly on a few things coming down the pipe uh, in videos to come. Number one, as a replacement for Rocky Mountain Audio Fest, have a nice surprise. Uh, talking with the guys with 3MA Audio in Houston, we've come up with an idea to do our own little quasi-audio fest and it's going to be the weekend of the 28th, I believe, the last weekend, the weekend of Halloween of October. And we're going to call it Spooktacular Audio Fest and, you know, booze, as in B-O-O-S or B-O-O-Z-E, however you want to. Great booze, great music, bloody good music. Maybe that's a good little pun. Anyway, we'll come up with a nice slogan for that. But... We were going to have 20 plus people uh, coming down, friends or customers of 3MA to Rocky Mountain anyway. So it's not that hard for them to come down here. At least some of them, you know, socialize. We'll have a good time. And, it'll, and I think 3MA is working on getting some of their distributors and brands that they carry. Some of their representatives come down. We'll have food, drink, uh, food truck. He's going to be... Uh, hiring Johnny, the owner of 3MA. Also, we're going to deck it out really cool with Halloween de uh, decorations, Halloween costumes, it's just a social fun time. 3MA has really done a great job building out their second floor and creating more listening room. So it'll be, we're probably going to have potentially an RSVP scenario if it looks like too many people are coming at one time. So stay tuned for that. I'm also going to be releasing the membership section of the YouTube channel and talking more about the benefits of that that I'll be offering as an aside just for those that want to support the channel and gain some of those other benefits. And one of which will be some of the behind the scenes of this uh, festival that we're doing, Audio Fest. And then also wanted to let you know about part two of the mini DSP SHD. I did release part one. If you haven't watched that, the next step would be getting into walking through the setup of it. And it's a 80 page manual for a preamp, but it's much more than a preamp. It's a deck. It's a server it's room EQ, parametric EQ, a crossover, active base management. It's also a direct live. So there's a very comprehensive tool set there that really requires, um, you know, more parts of a review than just telling you how it sounds after you hook it up, as I mentioned before. But even before that, I want you to get accustomed to why you might even want this piece and sold on it from the standpoint of it will give you the value. There's no point in buying this if you're not going to use it optimally and put in the time to learn how to use it and use as, as many of the tools as it offers, at least most of them specifically direct live and parametric EQ and the crossover functions. Those I think are a must. If you don't want to use the Volumio server, I'm not using that either. Uh, but there are some things that you're definitely going to want to be, if you're going to buy this piece, make sure you use these tools that it offers. And so before we even get to that walkthrough part of the video that I'm going to do, I want you to go ahead and start doing a couple things to sell yourself. Don't take my word for it with parametric EQ. There's so many people with dogmas. Oh, EQ is bad. It does this, that, and the other. And there's so many people that are advocates of direct live and so many people that use it wrong. You know, I've seen some pretty bad videos actually on direct live on YouTube and parametric EQs. But in any case, what I did was I created a little video where I can kind of help you Learn for yourself. Trust your own ears. Go through this exercise yourself and sell yourself on, yeah, there is something to it. Kind of like that diagram I put up in the last video of where you kind of start realizing there's something to this digital EQ and potentially direct live. And we haven't even talked about the impulse response correction, which I think is even bigger, arguably, improvement. But that's a separate topic. In this video today, I'm just going to piggyback at the end of this with a little bit of walkthrough of how you can kind of sell yourself on 
whether you believe there's something to using EQ or not. If you can go through this exercise and say, you know, I can't make it better. I can't do anything. I just want to just not even deal with it. Then don't buy this piece. Don't even watch the rest of the reviews. Save you a lot of time that way. But if you go through this exercise and then you convince yourself, hey, you know what? I probably do want to invest some time learning this more and have a piece that will allow me to do this. And I find some enjoyment in this. I find it worthwhile. That's where the rubber hits the road, whether this piece is for you or whether it's not. For people that do enjoy this, this is the only piece pretty much out there that does all of these things and will give you these tools other than maybe some surround sound processors, but nothing to this level. And so if you do sell yourself on this, I think this will be a really important piece to your system that you'll find invaluable. But if you don't, you know, I don't want to waste your time. Go through and teach yourself and learn for yourself and convince yourself one way or the other. So let me go ahead and flip into out uh, going to my chair and I'll put my screen up here and walk you through a playlist and some things that'll help you diagnose whether this piece may be for you or not. Okay guys, all you're gonna need to do is have something like Rune, a player software that has EQ embedded in it and there's a DSP function, if you can see on my screen here, that is embedded in Rune. Other player softwares also have plugins you can use for that. So hopefully you've got that and then you're gonna need some form of test tone CD and a lot of the streaming services have it. Just look it up. Uh, I use Focal Tool CD so if you have that feel free to use that and what you're gonna to want to do is go down to the test tones that are in pretty tight intervals as you can see here all the way up to 20 kilohertz and what you're going to want to do, we're not going to be using SPL meters other than let's just get one thing out of the way first. When you're playing these test tones, you're going to want to set your volume control and loudness at a level that usually is the loudest you normally listen to. So if you normally that 10 o'clock on the dial, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, you know, whatever it is. And you can use an SPL meter kind of to judge if that's how you judged your max listening volume in the past. Usually it's somewhere in that 80, 85 dB range for most normal humans. <laughs> somewhere of 95 to 100, I, under, I totally understand that. But whatever it is, that's what's gonna uncover usually the problems that make sound grating, fatiguing, and, pr and evidence is problematic areas. You don't usually hear problematic frequency response areas at low volumes, that it, and it doesn't bother you as much. But, and sometimes even those peaks and value, valleys give you artificial dynamics at low volumes that people prefer, and that gets them dogmatically against EQ, when really though, when you turn the volume up and they want that visceral impact, really get into the music, it quickly gets grating, fatiguing, they turn it down or they blame the recording, you know, and then they turn off their system and get disappointed. The whole point here is that we should be able to get you to the point, it was a big you know, revelation on my side where now I can turn my system up louder and louder and louder. Everything's in order. I'm not getting that grating, fatiguing sound. I've taken care of those artificial dynamic peaks and valleys that were okay at lower volumes, but really problematic at higher volumes. So listen to these test tones at a higher volume and just go through manually clicking or you can just you know hit fast forward after you've heard them for a little while and judge for yourself we're not using an SPL meter or even a mic like you get with the direct uh, the mini DSP and all that stuff there'll be time for this we'll get to that in the future but this is just about for those people trust your ears this is the exercise for you you're trusting only your ears listen to these test tones and then tell yourself try to be your own SPL meter what do these sound like in relation to each other? Is one louder than the other when you're listening? As you go up, is it getting more uh, increased SPLs? Are you thinking it's higher? Um, and are certain frequencies standing out to others louder than others? All of these, you may even want to jot it down on a piece of paper to kind of get your thoughts. And then you can go back through with an SPL meter and see if what you heard through your own ears matches up to what an SPL meter says. It's not to say this is right or your ears are wrong, but it's to say that 
hey, sometimes the sensitivity of our ears is different than what, you know, empirically it's measured at. And so in a lot of cases, higher frequencies will sound louder to you than lower frequencies. And so in your initial notes, when you're just using your ear, you're like, man, that sounded louder. But then when I did my SPL meter, they were almost the same. Well, what should you trust? Ultimately, you're going to want to trust your ears because even Harman has done some studies and shown that humans are more sensitive to certain frequencies than others. And so they came up with what's called a Harman curve. And let me go ahead and bring up the DSP. Let me make sure you guys can see that. Yeah. So one thing you're going to want to do is may perhaps have a curve similar to what Harman came up with, which is about 1 dB per octave. If that's what you heard, it may not be surprising that it'll be something like this. This may be a little too drastic, but something that gradually has higher base frequency response and SPL than the higher frequencies. So this, generally speaking, is a human just characteristic for most people. Now, on the flip side, I've gone to tons of systems, though, where people have their subwoofer turned up really high, so the bass is ultra heavy, or there's a room mode that's really loud. So when I go through the frequency sweep with my ears, that really stands out. So you may have to have dips in bass areas. Again, I'm just giving you general parameters, and there's no way for me to give you 30 years worth of real-time experience and all the measurements and testing that I do. Um, in one video this is really an exercise for you to do on your own try to figure out you know generally speaking if you heard any trend for your ears being more sensitive at certain volumes and come up with a curve that kind of just fixes that let's not deal with fixing individual frequencies that you may have heard like maybe 2.5 kilohertz uh, maybe a lot louder than one kilohertz in some respects don't worry about fixing individual anomalies at this point just try to get the general curve correctly where in general it's it's flowing the way you heard it through your own ears the reason being and then you go back through with the parametric eq on again you can click it on and off with this little button right here go back through the test tones and listen to them again and see if it doesn't sound more even to you make more adjustments make them slowly go ahead and even you can try to do smaller anomalies as you go but i'm going to touch base on that in a second but try to just do it with general wide and let me make sure you understand how to do the for people that are really new to it if you're in the dsp area you're going to have the ability to take a frequency like this pick the frequency Choose how much you want to add or subtract. And I'm going to, again, if you haven't seen my previous videos, always subtract. You know, it's better to bring everything down than to try to put anything up. You have run too much the risk of digital clipping. And I've seen, I've seen some horror stories that people have given advice on YouTube. And I'll go into that in a separate video. Probably in the membership section because i got to call people out on that. But in any case... Don't add. Um, you run the risk of digital clipping and creating problems. And even, um, let me even de deviate real quick because I'm going to talk about the Q here. You can do narrow ranges or wide ranges. And as I kind of intimated, you're going to want to start off by doing wide ranges in very subtle amounts, not a lot. When you're doing wide ranges, even things as little as 0.5 db can be audible especially when you get to certain songs and voices if you hit it in the right area and cover the right area it doesn't take much so you're not going to want to see drastic and steep curves one way or the other um, i've seen this with some people that look at the frequency response they measure a speaker they say in an anechoic chamber it's got this uh, peak right here so they come in here and they make a very narrow dip or they do the opposite if it's you know add a little bit this is not the way to use eq in my opinion yes you can empirically tie this change to what is measured in a anechoic chamber the way the speaker measured but that's not how it sounds at your listening position odds are it may as a good you know anecdotal evidence that it could but 
most times when people try to do this narrow range, they never get it right. Whatever translated in the anechoic chamber usually doesn't, or quasi-anechoic measurements, doesn't translate at your listening position. And it'll really be a little bit off here or here. So you really have to do it by ear, or you're just going to create another peak, and that's, that's that same peak is still going to be there that's already been there before. And let me show you why that's the case. Let's go back to the... Um, test tones. If you go to these test tones in the higher frequency range and when you're playing these, go ahead and play 6.3 kilohertz, 8 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, and just turn your head while they're playing. Literally, same position, turn your head while they're playing. It will sound differently, just barely changing your head. So if you're relying on a measurement mic that told you in an anechoic chamber one foot away, that there was a peak at a certain frequency, yeah, good luck guessing that that is going to translate all the way to your listening position. And when it can change, these wavelengths are so small that, again, narrow changes, and I've seen this with so many people online do EQ, it doesn't translate and it's not worth trying. So don't do these kind of narrow changes. There'll be time and a place for maybe doing that in certain areas when you're super advanced. But at this point, you're gonna just wanna be doing wide Q, general, so that when you hear that frequency sweep again, it just sounds more normal. There's not as many, from the end to end, it's not as big a delta to your ears in terms of loudness. And that will allow you to play the recordings louder and even out a lot of things that, per your listening position and your ears, sounds right. You can't, you can't get any better than that. You can try all this extrapolation of anechoic chamber measurements all you want, or even do crossover changes like da Danny does to fix an inherently bad speaker. But as I've said before, it really matters what's at your listening position and your ears and your sensitivity. So that's kind of where I'm in between both Danny and Amir. They go to polar opposites. I'm kind of in the middle. I'm about what your ears say at the listening position, okay? I don't care if you use EQ for anechoic measurement or crossover parts to fix it. Those are great. Definitely want that done, just like you want room treatments to treat base area mainly in your room. But ultimately, it's what at your listening position and your ears and just slight deviations can change things. So it's very important that you trust your ears and settle it in for where you're going to be positioned the most. Okay, I've got to stop here, I'm gonna pause, and then I'm gonna show you how we can translate this to music because test tones are a little bit different than music. Test tones don't provide harmonics that influence a large area. So what I'm gonna do is now take the improvements that you've made and hopefully now the light's going off. So, hey, I was able to improve a frequency response. In theory, that'll translate to music, but let's go ahead and prove it. Let's go ahead and see if we can get music to sound better. So let me pause and I'll bring up some playlists that you can use to test that. Okay, what you see here is some female tracks, female vocal tracks that I use to test what normally is a problematic area for a lot of systems that need EQ in rooms that aren't treated well or electronics that are poor designed or have issues is that Female vocals tend to sound grating, glare, fatiguing at certain frequencies and at certain volume levels. And people can't turn it up or it has a lot of sibilance and issues like that. And all of these things can be fixed with EQ. You don't believe me? You're going to be able to prove it to yourself. And one track, I'm going to scroll through the entire track so you can pause this video and put these in your playlist yourself. Sorry, I can't share it, but um, I'll scroll through all these and you can put these in a playlist yourself. But I go through all of these because these are different voices with different tonality, different richness, different delicacies, different frequencies. But let me point out a few in particular. This first one, Storm McCree by Bonnie Raitt, that's one that's particularly good at evidencing problems in certain frequency ranges. Her voice can actually sound very grating and fatiguing or glare or resonance at certain volume levels on poor systems. So you're going to want to play this track loud and see if there's anything irritating to you about this song. And if there is, then 
odds are good you can fix a lot of it with EQ and this is one you're going to want to start with first and maybe play in the 3 to 6k range maybe even down to 2.5k you know start playing very modest changes and then see if you can't replay it and it gets better or worse one thing you might want to do and I've done this a ton is every time you make a change you can save EQ curves so that you can always go back to something that you thought worked and did. And as you can see, I go days after day after day after day saving each day a new curve, a new curve, just to see if I can fine tune things a little more, a little more as I go through hundreds of songs in my playlist. And let's talk about that real quick because I've heard dogmatic things of, okay, I wasn't at the recording, so I don't know what was a reference. Well, that's true. Nobody was at the recording, and we don't know if they had high standards or low standards, or if the musician just signed off on it listening through you know, his phone, or whether he sat in the studio and they put a lot of effort into you know, mastering and nitpicking how it was mastered and sounded. You don't know these things, all that's true, but it's not a reason to just throw up your hand and say, okay, you know, we're just gonna have to live with whatever. That's not, that's a primitive way of looking at things. The way you should look at it is that most of the people in mastering jobs are not just Craigslist guys off the street. Yes, there are loudness wars. Yes, there are poor recordings. Yes, there are people that are not as good as others, but they do have a some level of expertise to get these jobs. And the musicians aren't totally deaf in most cases. They want the stuff to sound good. So from a certain aspect you have to give them credit for a certain baseline of performance it and when your system sounds like crap you have to really ask yourself did they really sign off on that crap did they really not have a good system to listen to it did they really or are you just using that as an excuse for your own issues that you're failing to address with your system that's a big eye-opening step in your evolution of audiophile. Stop blaming the recording, mastering studio for everything that sounds bad. You know, that's why all these rooms, like, all they can play is Keith Don't Go and Patricia Barber and stuff that's easy to play because they never fix really the issues with their equipment and their room and they can't play anything else and they don't want to play anything else because it'll sound like crap. And then they're going to blame the, the, the recording studio, the mastering and all that. In most cases, these people are competent. And the way you can go past the fact that you weren't there, yes, you weren't there. But if you make a change that fixes a song like this one, Storm McCree with Bonnie Raitt, then you can go through a bunch of other tracks and see if it didn't also improve the performance of vocals on those tracks especially ones that have the same tonality and the same frequencies as her voice. Then you can kind of extrapolate, even though you weren't there, you can say, hmm, that pretty much makes sense. That's probably what they heard versus the crap I was listening to uncorrected because it not only fixed her voice, it fixed this other recording as well. And then it fixed this one and that one. Or maybe I need to go and tweak my settings a little bit so that it improves both recordings as good. Heck, you can even save an EQ per recording. That's that's one of the benefits of this as well, if you wanted to go to that length. But I go through and I just all the time find new recordings where mm, maybe I went a little too far. It did help me with Bonnie Raitt on this one, but it went a little too far on this other recording. So then I'll adjust it. Then I'll play them both again. And I'll be like, yeah, actually. And then you start saying, you know what? That's probably what the mastering engineer heard now you're not blaming it the recording in a, in a vacuum anymore you're starting to realize that you know part of it is your room your setup you know just your room and how it's reflecting different frequencies and like i said just turning your head slightly can really peak a certain wavelength a lot and make a big difference in the tonality and in your enjoyment of the music so you have to be cognizant of all the things that are under your control and that are your fault, not arbitrarily blame, you know, everybody's poor mastering. 
And if you go through this, especially songs that have long notes, like Jennifer Warren's, I've done a lot of videos with her track, And So It Goes, she holds notes like wounds. Now, if that sounds electronic-y or harsh or has a little bit of glare or resonance versus being like a normal person saying the word wounds, then that is very telling. Um, Sarah McLaughlin holds a lot of notes for a long time. And sometimes you think that it's her voice modulating. No, it's usually the peaks and valleys in your frequency response that's causing that. You know, you'll there's just a sense of rightness that you'll learn. There's no way for me to extrapolate this to you and share it with you via video. You'll learn as you go along. It's like, oh, wow. Yeah, it was my system that was causing that little irritating resonance at certain part in that song it wasn't the recording it wasn't this you know you can fix a lot of these things and even songs that have uh, synthetic type additions like synthesizers like harmonizers maybe not auto-tune but like freer uh this lost without you song freer uh writings you know artificial echo and harmonizers a lot of times it will uncover problematic issues in your frequency response and you'll just blame it on, oh, it's a harmonizer. Oh, it's a, you know, auto tune. No, once you get it corrected, then you'll realize, yeah, I know it's an auto tune. I know it's a harmonizer playing, but it's not making that irritating problem that I was hearing before. And so a lot of these synthesizers do hit these frequencies in a more broad manner and exacerbate problems in your frequency response. So go through these on your own and Conway Bay by Judith Owen. That's one I definitely would put in your playlist. Definitely oh, got a phone call. Hold on one second, please. Okay, sorry. I think I was talking about uh, Conway Bay here. That's another one. The voice, voice can sound hard or glary on certain systems. I heard it at one show. Oh my God, it was awful. But her voice is still in a right system. It's very delicate, just pristine. You can almost hear the saliva as she parts her lips to start certain words. This should be a beautiful song and sound great. Oh dear, I've done a lot of tracks on different systems and you've probably even noticed if you've seen those videos. Some sound a little more too etched. It is kind of close mic'd and maybe even a hot mic in some respects, but she's singing very delicately close and it shouldn't be super etched and super sibilant. Um, you can blame it on the recording, but when you start adjusting things properly for this recording and then seeing that that adjustment extrapolates over a lot of different recordings and fixes things in a lot of different recordings, then you'll realize, oh, you know, it wasn't just hot mic in one recording that's the problem. I actually had to adjust my frequency response in a certain area to adjust that and certain frequencies take care of sibilance. On male vocals, I'll go, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I'll do this in more detail later. But with male vocals, there's one track in particular, Hey Laura by Gregory Porter. I know from the very first two words, he, he starts off the song, Hey Laura. There's a hardness to certain male vocals that I don't like. And Leonard Cohen, I hear it a lot on certain systems, uh, Eric Bibb. You know, there's a hardness and you're going to learn what frequencies um, impact certain vocals, male vocals versus females and vowels versus other, you know, sibilant tones, consonants. Um, hey, Laura is one that could sound should sound great, but on a lot of systems, it doesn't. It's a little too harsh and hard and his voice is too hard during that entire song on certain systems. And it's really in that range of 200 to 300 hertz. If you do hear that problem in your system, start playing with dipping it a little bit, not a lot, but, and then playing it again and see if it helps out and then dip a little bit more. A lot of frequencies that you don't think go down to 200 hertz when you're hearing them play, they actually do. And one thing about the mini DSP, let me just show you real quick. The mini DSP SHD, let me see if I can get this on the screen for you. And you should be able to see that now. So one of the th cool things you'll have <clears throat> in the B Mini DSP SHD, and I'll get to this in more detail in the next video, but you'll be able to see what signal is being sent to your left, right, and your two subwoofers. And what's really cool is when you're hearing maybe something that just maybe symbols or think you th things you think are totally high frequencies, but you're seeing lots of material and signal 
being sent actually to your subwoofer even crossed over super low at 50 hertz or lower and you're like how could it be sending signal to that i'm not hearing 50 hertz but there's so much harmonics to music that you may not understand that how robust you know that is and how important it is to get that full frequency response and that's why subwoofers are important and i deal with that all in my subwoofer and videos and why it's important to have full range speakers because if you don't have full range that's one of the priorities I mentioned in floor standing speakers full range one way or the other either they do it or you do it with subwoofers you're never going to get the full harmonic richness and accuracy of playback and you're always going to be you know shortchanging yourself and not hearing getting a window on that performance so that's what's important to understand um, full range speaker system is going to be required and if you're not getting certain tones being played when you do the test tones then that's a problem you're going to want to address that as well uh, if you're not even getting 20 hertz then you're going to need to get that um, before you even start trying to fix things all right so i want to stop here this is a very primitive you know tutorial at this point but it's enough to get you started to kind of question yourself and say yeah i was able to actually make a sound a song in this playlist sound better i made the frequency sweep sound better by using the eq and then if you've done that then you're on that one step further on that graph i showed you to realizing going from eq is a waste of time and i know it's going to nothing can help it can't help anything to now there's something to this and then you're going to invest some time going through these playlists playing with it some more and then you'll realize that there's a lot more to this and there's a lot of things you can do so this is just step one to kind of you know enlighten you to maybe if you're on that fence of whether this is the product for you this shd that i'm reviewing if you can go through this exercise and see some light at the end of the tunnel then you're really going to enjoy the rest of my series on the mini dsp shd and how to use it properly because then we're going to have direct live doing a lot of this stuff for you we're going to have uh, impulse response correction and crossover points for your sub and your main and then we're also going to have this parametric eq that can further fine tune things for your exact ears at your listening position so stay tuned sign up subscribe and i'll see you back here soon